Welcome back to the Banter Salon here at Other Voices in Derry. It is an absolute honour to have this gentleman here with us today. His name is Ed Vulliami. He writes for The Observer. He writes for The Observer on many things. Uh, stories from foreign places, wars from foreign places. Mexico, Iraq, Iran, Birmingham. You write about everything. Ed, first of all, before we, before we, before we head to Mexico, um, tell me how you got into journalism in the first place. Um, actually, I'm going to do what politicians do and not answer the question. Ah, Ed. No, just quickly, quickly, quickly. What an honour it is, because there's something, and it's not. This is just uh, there is something about the way these things are done in Ireland, which is better than anywhere else. And I'm, that's not sucking up. That's not you know. It, it's uh, it's on it's at another level, and it's just fun, and it's it's an honour, really. I mean, I had, to, I had to cut out with great difficulty last night, and I'm not going to tonight. Good. And also, it's just fantastic to open, as it were, be the opening app for the best Europe best journalist in Europe, most extraordinary woman who's about to appear later, at top of the bill. Um, to answer your question, it's actually sorry, quite embarrassing, and it's not actually that interesting. I, 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 I was on the dole for a year in Liverpool on account of an Irish nurse and, uh, uh, who I thought was more interesting than, than trying to get a job. And um, I couldn't get a job. I tried to go into law school to be a lefty lawyer, and I couldn't get in. And then um, I got a job uh, on the Tavistock Times in Devon. And you're supposed to say, oh, they were the happiest years of my life on local paper. But they were fucking miserable. <laughs> um, the and then I got a job. It was, well, you know, it was, actually, there was one good story when the Hell's Angels castrated somebody. <laughs> okay. But apart from that, it was pretty boring. And then I got a job on the Granada Reports local news in Manchester as Tony Wilson's researcher, which was exhausting because yeah. that meant he was the entrepreneur of, uh, of a sort of certain brand of pretty depressing music. And that meant um, basically getting him out, setting up a film to, for him to do that for that night's programme, trying to get him out of bed before 12, 12 o'clock or more lunchtime to do it, to sort of de-coke and do the film and then get him on air by six. And that was pretty stressful too. Yeah. So that's how I Then I got a job on World in Action, and that's when I first came to Derry, when we uh, uh, made a film which included a shot of Patsy O'Hara in his coffin, which the IBA banned. Um, and those are the days when, when television had the guts to say, we won't pull the shot, either the programme goes out or it doesn't. Yeah. And that was my introduction to this wonderful city. Yeah. Moving from Derry to Mexico, hmm. where did your fascination with Mexico begin? Did it begin when the, when the observers send you out there, or had you an obsession beforehand with Mexico? Well, um, it sort of comes into our conversation about the coverage of warfare. Um, sorry to lower the tone after Brona Gallagher, everybody. Um, but uh, I, I've always loved Mexico. Uh, it's one of those countries you never quite know where the bottom is. It has the brightest of colours and the darkest of shadows. Uh, it has a Journalists, every journalist who uses the word exotic should be fined if not fired, in my view. Um, but it has that sort of, those dichotomies, those mysteries. But I, no, I, I, I became involved in, in it professionally and in this book uh, because I was living in the United States. I was covering the US. I was, uh, um, uh, New York interests some people. I thought it was rather hubristic and passed its best. And I became fascinated by the border. This phenomenon, this place that seemed to belong to both countries and yet neither. And I wanted to write a book about the busiest commercial frontier and the, 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 the crises of identity migration across that border. And the book changed. You know, I'm, I'm not a good guy to, to hang around with, really, because um, you know, I sort of went to, to, be, to live in Italy and found myself in Bosnia for three years. I went to New York and found myself in Iraq because al-Qaeda arrived shortly after I did in New York. And then I went down to write a book about this rather wonderful place on the border and the drug war broke out. So, you know, don't come anywhere with me. You know, if you, um, I, I'm an accidental war correspondent. And, and, um, but look, I'll answer your question properly now. Um, I had worked in Iraq... I'd worked twice, both times around, and in Bosnia. Iraq, I had found repulsive, repellent in so many ways, um, and I felt it was a war of the hangover of the 19th century into the 20th, a war of empire, if you like, and specifically British empire, uh, as taken over by the 
the, um, the, the, the vile imperium, equally vile imperium of the United States. Um, then Bosnia, which was an entirely different experience. It's at an entirely di different level. It changed my life, and I, it will always be part of me, that, 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 that horrific story and those wonderful people, um, which I felt was a sort of a 20th century war hanging over into the 21st now. Genocide, ethnic violence. So there was a war of empire, a war of, 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 um, of, of, of genocidal slaughter. But Mexico rapidly became something else, and that's, that's what preoccupied me and preoccupies me very much indeed. Mexico, what is happening there, the carnage, the now death of 55,000 people with 25,000 more disappeared, almost certainly dead, and boy are they killed. I'm not here to subject you to the sort of pornographic coverage of some of the things that happened in that country, but um, people are killed slowly with a perverse innovation, um, and their bodies are, as I think you probably all know, spectacularly exhibited to make a point. We won't labor on that. Um, what struck me about Mexico is that, A, nobody seems to count it as a war. Yeah. Because when I was in Ciudad Juarez, which is the most dangerous city in the world by a very, very long way, Sarah Brightman came to sing, as if the poor fuckers hadn't suffered enough or not already. Um, and uh, 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 life goes on. The market is open. Uh, you get on a plane, and I'm going off to be terrified in Veracruz again, and there's a whole lot of backpackers about to get the bus, and I'm glad they're not my daughters, to be honest. Anyway... It, it, it doesn't count. Why, why, do you think that, why do you think that sort of ignorance is there? Why do you think that naivety is there? You know, that people don't realise it's a war and people don't take it seriously as a war. Well, I think for the, for the same reasons as I think it is so terrifying. <clears throat> Mexico is the 21st century war for some very, very important reasons. And that's why we don't count it like we do Afghanistan rightly and Syria rightly and Libya, which we're going to hear about later, rightly, let alone Iraq, please. Um, <clears throat> And I think it's this 21st century war for many very important reasons. And some, you know, I can get quite pointy headed about this. And if I do, you throw things or kick me. You know, it's about nothing, essentially. It belongs to what I see as a post political, post moral, post intellectual age that we belong to. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a war that belongs to, the economists call it, high capitalism. Yes, it's about drugs. Yes, if it has a cause, it is for the plazas that supply the coke and the meth and all the other stuff that the gringo in the United States and we in Europe are so kind of interminably, terminably addicted to. That's the best you'll get to a cause. I, I don't have much respect for any of the other causes, but nobody's trying to have a jihad, nobody's trying to stop a jihad, no one's trying to gas the Jews or stop them gassing the Jews. That's pretty much all it is. But it's not even that. Um, there's no money, really, in wiping out teenaged addicts trying to recover in some miserable rehab centre in a pebble dash building on the outskirts of Tijuana. There's not much traction, really, in deciding, actually, today, hey, Pablo, why don't we go and wipe out all those kids who clean windscreen wipers at the traffic lights, which they do. Um, it's, it's a war about absolutely, and forgive me, fuck all. And I think there's a lot about this society which is about fuck all. Please forgive me. I, it's just the way I speak. I can't Don't help worry it. about it. Um, and this, I think, is terribly important. It means that these 55,000 people have been brutally and sadistically murdered for basically no reason at all. Uh, it was true of all the people who died in the siege of Sarajevo as well. But Karadzic and Mladic had their cause. Um, and I was against it. It's, I don't have a stake. I mean, it's hard to develop a, a, deep, a deep position between the Sinaloa cartel and the Gulf cartel. I mean, it doesn't sort of matter to most people really who wins. It does to them. Uh, and then there's another element which we, perhaps we can move on to later, um, which, is that, which makes it the 21st century war. Um, and, well, there are two. One is the economic backdrop to it. Mm. 
and the other is what happens to the money. Because we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars, none of which stays in Mexico. I think 2.4% roughly stayed in Colombia, and the same will be true of Mexico. The money is in the system. The money is in the cranes you see in Europe and the United States. The money is at the drinks parties in Holland Park and on the golf courses of Connecticut. We'll get to that later, I hope. Mm. Um, but the economic backdrop is this, if I can explain. We live in this global economy now, which has caused this war, I think, which is based on the notion that multinational corporations can go around the world scouring it for the lowest wage they can pay. In shorthand, this means Mexico is next door to the United States. It's cheap. So we will establish huge cities full of, full of factories in which people go along and put together the shit that America needs. The plasma TVs, the this, that, and the other. The, 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 I mean, there are whole factories devoted to the, the things that make a, a, a car seat go forward and backwards, that kind of thing. And they make this stuff. And then, in their wisdom, the corporations think, well, actually, you know, we, despite the transport costs, we can do it even cheaper in Honduras, or even cheaper mm -hmm. in the Mexican interior, or sometimes even in Bangladesh. And you leave these, these, these horrific megalopolises, which had no water or schooling in the first place. Now they don't even have the factories. Now when that happens in Swansea, everybody just, you know, the whole thing just collapses, but not on the border. No, hey, voila, we got a job for you. We can, hey, you want to work? We got work. We can drive this car. Oh, there's somebody in the trunk. Never mind, just drive it. Um, and then it gets up to being then the getaway car. Then you can be a sicario. Then you can be a mass sicario and all this stuff. There's plenty of work there. But what does this mean? Um, there's a place called Riberas del Bravo, for instance, on the outskirts of Ciudad Juarez. It's built on a marsh for reasons that are all to do with corruption, all to do with the proximity of the factories to the, to the American interests. Um, it's about only 30% populated now. They've all gone. But the gangs have burned out the empty houses. I talked to the priest um, uh, who, who, actually, they stole everything out of his office and his church. Um, he said, I have to go to six funerals of the children um, in the last a couple of weeks to, to whom the accidents happened. Sorry, what accident? Oh, yes, well, when the woman finds a new man, they kill the children from the first marriage so they can sort of start again. You know, it's that kind of depravity. Yeah. Um, and this is all about drugs. I don't want to sound like, you know, Mary Bloody White House, but the fact is that, you know, people don't take drugs like they do in, in, in the Groucho Club or in the, at the Isle of Wight Festival to, you know, to, to, to feel horny and make the party go with a bang. Most people take drugs because life's so fucking unbearable they want to get as far out of their heads as possible. Yeah. And that's what happens in Rivas del Bravo. And this is the beginning of the war. This is where the war begins. Yeah. Just, just, just use this something if there. If you'll pardon me. Yeah, use something there about, like, I mean, the depravity. You know, you're talking about, like, you know, the, the, you, you didn't go into kind of like the pornographic images or whatever, but, you know, when we hear stories, when I read your reports, when I read reports from that particular region, the, 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 the it just, that depraved is the right word, right? The local people, I mean, surely some of them are just kind of going, like, we don't want this anymore. We, we, we don't want this anymore. Or is it the case that they've been one bought off, two scared off, or three, there's not enough of them anymore to object? Because it just sounds to me that it's just, it's just been taken over the narcos. They, they, they run it. They run that, that area in Mexico now. They do in a way. I mean, interestingly, what's happened between, um, say, 20 years ago and now. Sorry, just to qualify the, the, the answer. In the, I mean, I think we should know about criminal syndicates of, on this scale. I mean, I, like, you know, I think we should know about Shell. I think we should know about BP. I think we should know about Apple. And we should know about the other big multinational corporations whose names are the Sinaloa cartel, the Zetas, the, 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 the Gulf cartel, and the Camorra of Naples, because they operate on exactly the same rules. It's fundamental to my argument that the, that the criminal narco cartels are not adversaries of a legal economy, or even pastiches of it. They are pioneers of it. These people we're talking about in Mexico, they were doing free trade across the Americas long before Bill Clinton signed the NAFTA agreement. It was their idea. Uh, this whole thing of the Machiladoras, the assembly plants I've been talking about, you know, this was all part of, this was going on long before the corporations started. And they were also outsourcing. The narco cartels invented outsourcing, this, you know, absurd thing you have now whereby somebody else cleans the streets of a local authority so they don't get cleaned properly and all the rest of it. You know, why the mail never arrives at the Guardian anymore is because we've outsourced it. Well, the narcos invented this. So they do run it. Um, but they run it on, 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 on a system of street gangs. In a nutshell, what happened was the old pyramids 
collapsed. The whole idea of the Don, like mm. uh, what's his name, Marlon Brando in the movie in Sicily. There was one in Mexico. He was called Felix Gallardo. They shattered to leaner and meaner guys. Who, who don't, why should I have lunch with a politician? I've got a martial arts class. I want a new tattoo. Uh, they can't read and write, but they understand capitalism a whole lot better. They're more ruthless about it, just like a normal corporation. Who, these people who also can't read and write, but they understand capitalism. Um, and so they do control it, but they control it through the institutions of state. You asked me about the good guys. Yeah. <laughs> why, where is the resistance? Like this is what's so weird. You know, as an old lefty, which I am, and I make no apologies for that, um, the, 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 you know, we expect there to be a, a sort of a union, a, a community resistance to this. Well, actually, there sort of isn't. And that's partly because uh, people are just too damn scared. And partly because people are now, they're, in, they're, in, they're involved in the phantasmagoria. I mean, I said to, there's a very, very brave man called, called Mario Trevino who works in a a town in Reynosa, which is run by the most uh, uh, terrifying criminal organization in the world at the moment called Los Zetas, which is, a, which is a, basically a paramilitary narco-militia cartel of tens of thousands of people, most of them ex-military and police. Um, and um, he, he runs poetry and uh, literary festivals in this place. And he's, he said, but the, these are revolting people, he said, and um, a lot of them are doing what they're doing. Uh, because they've got the $300 Armani T-shirt, and next week they must have the $500 Cavalli T-shirt, because if they don't, that chica won't go out with them, and they won't get this SUV. And anyway, the other guy, he's got a two Cavalli, and he's yeah, got yeah, the 700 yeah. I said, Mario, Mar no, 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 it, it, it can't be this banal. Surely we want bigger explanations. Come on, people are going to talk about this in Ireland. No, no, he said, don't underestimate that level of crappy, banal explanation for the killing and the torture. And he said, this is, these are the brands. We hear this word all the time, brand, brand, brand. He said, in Mexico, la violenza es que una brand. And it is. They're, they're brilliant at YouTube. They, they have hit sites. They love it. Yeah. I was at a conversation with people, this is 20th, 21st century conversation, about, about, about a war imagery. Very earnest Peruvian. Ah, oh, yes, and we will get the picture of the girl on the burning bridge in, Viet on the bridge in Vietnam. We will get your picture from Bosnia of the, of the concentration camp. I said, but this is all great, but nowadays, but this is out of date, my dear comrade. Nowadays, what the Zetas do is they put their own atrocities up on YouTube as recruitment posters. Mm. You don't put on what the terrible things the other guy did. You put on what you did because mm. you're proud of it. And everybody else will want to come and do it because it's fun yeah. to rate young factory girls and chop them up and put them in body bags and stick them out in the desert. It's fun to decapitate people and hang them upside down from the, from, from the motorway bridges because you'll be on television. You're it can be a big boy yeah. I think and I think this is interesting yeah. and my you know my friend and, and the thing is, is it's, it's interesting because not only does this connect to us because Sarah Brightman sings in the places where these happen it connects to us because every now and then you can see a little pieces of this little whiff of it coming to Glasgow coming to Marseille coming to to, to, to Swansea uh, Charles Bowden, who's the greatest writer on the border, put it this way. He said, Sudet Juarez is not a breakdown of the social order. Sudet Juarez is the new order. Now, that's Chuck with his inimitable sort of mixture of whiskey and apocalypse. But, but he's on to something. Yeah. Actually, there's something I was kind of like thinking about as you were talking about the YouTube footage. There's also kind of narco ballads. You know, these, these songs. Uh, yeah, it's unreal. Uh, a, a guy called Mark Collin wrote a piece for the Irish Times about this, and he, he was describing the songs. And like he, people in the room here will, will know country and Irish music, and he described it basically as the Mexican version of country and Irish music. So you've got the likes of, de, uh, of, of kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think, Tommy Fleming, around these people singing. Imagine someone like Tommy Fleming singing a song about decapitation. I mean, close your eyes and imagine that. I mean, these narco songs are just unreal. Oh, I, mean, I mean, and it's it's it's, 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 the, it's their yeah. pop music. We talked yesterday about Psy and Gangnam Style. These songs are basically the Mexican version of Psy and Gangnam Style. It's horrible. Look it up on YouTube, you know. But uh, mm. moving on to what you were saying there about getting a sniff of things coming into here. You're writing a book at the moment, which is really, like when we when we were talking a couple of weeks ago. You mentioned this book you're writing, the Pinstripe Cartel, and my ears just went, "Whoa! You, <laughs> this is very this is interesting." There's a rule in journalism where you follow the money, and you follow the money. Well, I think one should always follow the money. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our inability to join dots 
in journalism, in life, in politics generally sort of astounds me sometimes. And um, uh, in a way, I sort of feel I've... Uh, uh, um, I've, I've, I've run out of adjectives now after kind of, you know, Iraq twice, Bosnia, um, now this, I, you know, I, my thesaurus is black. <laughs> um, uh, but what I do want to do is, is, is to bring this carnage in Mexico home, not just in the lines, you know, not just sort of in the, in, in the fancy Groucho Club or the Labour Party conference, you know, how many lives are going up your nose, because uh, there's all sorts of questions about ethical consumerism in this, um, but uh, but but just the money. I mean, the amounts of money involved are beyond the imagination. But I started to follow a couple of trails, and one of them was uh, a, a strange one. It was it's a little thing called the Casa de Cambio Puebla, and this is a hole in the wall. It's not even a bank. It's like a little when you go change some money in a in, in a in a street somewhere in Bayswater, whatever. Um, it turned out that the Wachovia Bank, which is a medium-sized bank now part of Wells Fargo, um, had well they'd laundered what we know to have been a fairly small amount, a matter of hundreds of millions of of money that was directly used to buy planes to smuggle cocaine on behalf of the Sinaloa cartel, which is the world's largest and most powerful criminal syndicate by a very very long way. Apart from, and I will say this with well, let's say the banks are not... It's called the Pinstripe Cartel, the book. Uh, it's being filmed. I'm going to be careful. OK. Wachovia, it turned out, had taken in $376 billion. Billion. A billion dollars over four years through this little hole in the wall that happened to be working for the Sinaloa Cartel. That's a lot of money. Um... Uh, and it so happened that the guy who was running their anti-money laundering scheme happened to be in London, happened to be a scouser, happened to be partial towards Liverpool Football Club, as I was until recently, and um, and and he told me the story. He, he started to, excuse me, uh, something funny here, all these huge checks coming in for exactly the same amount with funny signatures, and on, 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 you know, on, then it's always on a Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it was. Shut up. They spat him out, crushed him down. He, he left. Um, and they and they were caught. They, the feds had an investigation, and they they signed a, what they call a, a deferred prosecution. It's a kind of yellow card. Uh, ooh, don't do it again. Nobody goes to jail. It's a lot of cash. Um, I have to say, because this is being filmed, that uh, since then Wachovia has been bought over by Wells Fargo, who did fo who did cooperate fully with the federal investigation. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, a small print at the bottom on the American, you know, headache pill advert that's longer than the ad. So, but luckily we said it quickly. So, uh, well, there we go, that's Wachovia. Um, then I found out that this, a cease and desist order... Is this too pointy-headed and technical? No, no, no. no. Um, well, ban ban yeah. Banter is no, very pointy-headed. Th You're fine. Pointy-headed goes to loud, well, more than it is in some places. Um, and um, it's like, well, HSBC, cease and desist order. Not allowed to operate in Mexico. Ooh. HSBC, but that's the world's local bank. That's yeah. the biggest bank in Britain. It's the biggest bank in Europe, actually. It's the last thing you see when you leave the ramp at Heathrow, the world's local bank with lots of funny little jokes. And it's the first thing you see when you come up the ramp again at Mexico City, as I will do next Friday. Cease and desist order. Well, we don't know yet how much money HSBC, the world's local bank, uh, uh, took through that same series of holes in the window from that same cartel but we do know that something like fifth, between 7 and 15 billion of it was in cash, bulk cash. And it goes through the HSBC branch in the Cayman Islands. Of course, it has no employees or no street address. It's a cyber address. But there it is. It's part of the British jurisdiction. It's, uh, it's all part of the system. Everybody's uh, well, well connected there. Um, but, uh, but so I've started working on this now. HSBC, the financial wing of the Sinaloa cartel. See, now, I don't, I'm not hearing a lot of fuss about this. I, there's some, I think there's something, something wrong with me. This makes me angry. The guy who was running HSBC Mexico while all this was happening is called Paul Thurston. He, they were caught. He went to the Senate. He apologized. Don't do it again. Naughty boys. On the same week as this happened, a guy was caught selling 10 grams of crack over the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. He goes down for a mandatory 10 years in jail. 
But Mr. Paul Thurston, he's been promoted to head of global retail for the HSBC. Uh, his salary is several million. God knows what the bonus is. Better than that, you know, in this old idea that we were all brought up by our parents, you know, the captain was in charge of the ship. If it goes down, he's in charge. No, the, 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 the chief executive of the bank at the time that all this was happening uh, is now the Minister of Trade. He's now David Cameron's business minister. That, that, that's the level of sanction on these people. And I... There is only one stepping stone. In fact, there isn't even one stepping stone. There are no stepping stones between these gentlemen and the decapitated bodies hanging upside down from the bridges over the freeway, from the 340 young factory girls in Ciudad Juarez who were abducted, tortured, raped, mutilated and dumped in body bags and had their underwear changed with other ones to drive their mothers mad. What do HSBC and Wachovia say? Well, it's the usual corporate statement, isn't it? It's sort of, we accept, oh, mistakes were made, but we've got a new team in place now. No, 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 no gentlemen, no, 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 no. Um, what happened? How did it happen? I don't know how it happened. Well, I do know how it happened, but I've got to be very careful legally in how I write it. How is it covered in the press? Yeah. The Financial Times, quote, Mexico was turning out to be a compliance nightmare for the HSBC. Oh, I see. It was all those little brown people. They were, they were hood. We just went into a place that happened to have a narco war going on, happened to have the, one of the world's biggest uh, industries going on, producing hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, compliance problem. No, 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 no. Sorry, we'll talk about a long-winded answer to your question. You know, <laughs> concentration camps in Bosnia, they change your life. Uh, 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 interviewing the, the women who were raped and violated all night, every night in Bosnia. It changes your life. Um, talking to the people of Nasiriya and al-Basra about how the Americans and the British strafed their cities in order to liberate them and mass murdered them in order, in order to do so. Um, sort of that I sort of... I'm going to defer to someone who knows far more about this than me. It's apparently, and, yeah, uh, you say uh, Who's well. coming up. Um, what I want to try and do now is just get this, all of it, home where it belongs, into the corridors of power, to, you know, to the real criminals. And if I sound bitter and twisted, it's probably because I am. <laughs> but because, you know, you know, I was born in Notting Hill and my mum's still there. No, Notting Hill ain't Notting Hill no more, to paraphrase Frank Sinatra about New York. They're all there with their cocktail parties and their gym slip and mums and their personal trainers. They are laundering this money. They have the blood of Mexico on their hands. They are playing golf in Connecticut. They are having their cocktails in the Four Seasons Hotel. That's why I want to do this and that's why I feel that this, what's happening in Mexico is... is it, it, it isn't a Mexican, it isn't a war in Mexico. It's a war of the global economy, it's a war of the global collapse, it's the war of, of, of this, and it was your word, thank you, depravity. Um, and it's 55,000 and counting, it's 20,000 missing and counting, and no one has a clue what to do. You asked about the opposition. It's interesting. There is no left opposition. Even more curiously, there is no right-wing opposition. There is no kind of Mussolini and law and order. Enough! All there is, um, all there are, sorry, are incredibly brave women, because this is a very male war. It's, it's, it, it, it is a macho war. It is a misogynist war. Um, the, 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 the involvement of, the, of beauty queens as decoration who then become mutilated and, and, and things, it's, it's, that's all part of this, what Maria Trevino called the T-shirt culture yeah. of it. Uh, so there is a very strong and estimable and wonderful women's movement in Mexico for peace. And actually, whatever one's view of the Catholic Church, and you know, many of my views are not for repetition here, um, the, the priests are incredible. Uh, it's also a, a war of mammon, if you like. Mm. And um, there are priests working in, in, in northern Mexico especially, I mean, they've, who, who are quite extraordinary. Face them down. And they've, they've started murdering the priests in quite large numbers, which is a novelty. Uh, the old pyramidal Don with his Homburg would never 
or order his sicarios to kill priests. They did actually blow up a bishop once in Tijuana, sorry, back in the, in the 90s. Um, but that produced a whole crisis across kind of mundo narco, if you like. Uh, nowadays, they're sort of kidnapping, torturing, and, 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 and murdering priests on quite a, quite a large scale. Um, and if you talk to the Mexican government, they talk about the security issue. Oh, I see you're coming to cover security issues. The other weirdness of it all, just to conclude um, the point, is that Barry McCaffrey, the US, drugs are, he calls Mexico a failed state, and that's the weirdness, it's not. I mean, Mexico's response to swine flu was exemplary. I mean, the NHS couldn't have done it in a thousand years. Um, their, child their child literacy program in the schools is superb, contrasting sharply to the, you know, to the United Kingdom's child's illiteracy program. Um, uh, you, you know, I mean, it is in Gamba as they say. I mean, it works, Mexico. Mm. It's, it's, its bus service is far better than ours. Its metro system of Mexico City makes, you know, I mean, I mean the London Underground makes Mexico look like Switzerland. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, um, it, it works. Mm. But ha it's happening in our society. And I suppose, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that there are so many indications that the, the, the complete disintegration of Britain will start to echo these problems. Yeah, we're going to come back to that point as well. Like, you know, everybody's staying with us, but right now we're going to move. We're going to move from Mexico and we're going to move to <laughs> Africa and the Middle East. We're going to be joined by one of the... One of my colleagues from the Irish Times, um, like I write about music and pop culture of the Irish Times. This is Mary Fitzgerald. Mary Fitzgerald writes about wars in foreign places. She's one of the best journalists I've come across. An amazing, amazing woman. Please, please give a warm, first of all, a round of applause for Ed and a welcome to Mary. How did you end up in this, in this, uh, the game of journalism in the first place? Well, in, in an odd way, uh, Ed's story and mine kind of overlap. In you worked at the Tavistock Times. <laughs> in that, um, I was in secondary school when uh, the Bosnia War was raging, and it had a huge impact on, on me, you know, to see a conflict like this unfolding in the heart of Europe in the early 1990s. And just reading about it, uh, watching the TV reports at the time, just had this incredible impact. Now, I'm one of these rather pathetic types that have wanted to be a journalist since I was about this high, but the Bosnian War in particular, and seeing as well the generation of women journalists that we saw emerge in Bosnia, um, from Maggie O'Kane, mm -hmm. uh, the Irish journalist who then worked for The Guardian, Janine De Giovanni, Marie Calvin in The Sunday Times, Christiana Mapur reporting for CNN. It was the, you know, women had reported conflict and war before that, but the Bosnia war, it seemed to reach a critical mass. So that was hugely inspiring. Um, and then I came to study at Queen's in Belfast because uh, coming from uh, the Republic, coming from Cork, I wanted to study Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, the history of Northern Ireland, make up my own mind about the place. And living here as a student and then as a, a rookie reporter at the Bell Tell um, was such an interesting experience because to live in a divided society on the island in which I was born and, and grew up, to touch it, to feel it, um, to breathe it, um, was fascinating as a student and as a rookie journalist. And I have to say that the, the lessons that I learned living in Belfast, living in Northern Ireland, exploring Northern Ireland as a student and journalist, um, still echo for me um, in so many places that I travel to. Mm. Um, so I think that those were my kind of formative experiences in terms of um, becoming a journalist and becoming the kind of journalist covering the kind of issues I'm covering yeah. today. We, we talked earlier on, I mean, I, I was going to go through my list of kind of preemptive questions for you, you know, and th there was one thing you, you said, and immediately I kind of said, okay, I'm going to start with this. You, 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 you describe yourself as fascinated by Libya, you know, I mean, it, it's, and like, I mean, some of your reporting from, from Libya has been so vivid and like, I mean, so, so, just so on point. Well, what attracted you to Libya in the first place? Well, Libya in February 2011, um, the very first protest uh, began in the second largest city in Libya, Benghazi, on the 15th of February. And I think up to that point, Libya was a mystery to all of us. Um, for 42 years, um, it had been all but closed mm. off to the world, well, particularly to journalists. The only journalists who had uh, reported from Libya had reported as essentially guests of the regime, mm. and they were under severe restrictions. 
So I can remember entering eastern Libya, going over the Egyptian border, part of the first wave of journalists to enter uh, Libya at that stage. That was the 24th, 25th of February. And it was extraordinary because, first of all, you know, we didn't have visas. Our passports weren't checked. We were greeted by, you know, rebels firing in the air, offering us chocolate and juice and welcoming us to Libya Hura, free Libya. Um, but we had no idea what we were entering into because we had no idea of this country, the society, the people, what had happened really in that country for 42 years. It was like entering uncharted territory, as well as the fact we knew at that stage that this country was at the beginning of what might turn into a revolution similar to what we saw in, in Tunisia and Egypt. So from a journalist's perspective, it was fascinating. You know, mm. we were coming into a country where there were so many untold stories. And for the first time, Libyans felt comfortable, at least in Eastern Libya, they felt comfortable enough to talk about what they had gone through over 42 years. And everybody had a story. Everybody had an extraordinary story. Some of them horrific, most of them incredibly moving. Um, we were hearing, many of us for the first time, about, for example, the Abu Salim massacre, which I think, you know, up to the Libyan revolution, um, people really, the world didn't know about this. And this was a, a massacre of political prisoners in Abu Salim um, in 1996, Abu Salim being the most notorious um, prison in, in Libya for political dissidents. And uh, more than 1,200 prisoners were gunned down by security forces in a couple of hours. Um, and this... I think to understand Libya, you have to understand mm -hmm. the scar that that left behind. And, you know, I can remember one man, one protester in Benghazi saying to me, Abu Salim is the biggest wound in our country. And it was actually protest by the families of survivors of the Abu Salim massacre that sparked the wider uprising. So again, this momentous event for Libyans, but yet the outside world had no idea mm -hmm. about it. So I always describe Libya as being akin to the journalistic equivalent of a sweet shop, because when I'm there, it's, it's, you don't know where to start. There are so many stories. And that's what keeps bringing me back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a committed, I mean, Lindsay Hilson from Channel 4 is a good friend of mine. And, you know, I often joke that both of us suffer from a terrible case of Libyaphilia. You know, yeah. we just have developed this uh, yeah. obsession with the place. Yeah. Because I think so much of what's going on there now, um, we need to understand what happened over the last 42 years in Libya to understand what's going on now. And I think we we are starting from a, a basis of zero or little or zero knowledge about Libya. And I think that, you know, I would have an issue in many respects with the way Libya has been reported because we are starting from that uh, very, very low threshold mm. of, of knowledge and mm. information. I mean, during the week, you tweeted an interesting photograph. You, you, you showed the, uh, the old Libyan passport and new Libyan passport side by side. Nice photograph, you know. So, I mean, am I right to assume that all's, all's good in the hood then? Everything's good in Libya. We're back to normal then. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say that I count myself as a, a Libya optimist. Um, it's a, it's a difficult place to be at the moment, and certainly there have been a, moments over the last six months in particular where that optimism has been severely shaken. But at the same time, I've spent um, extensive periods of time in, in Libya during the revolution and afterwards. And I have to say, going back to that point again about the reporting from Libya, there are very few journalists based in Libya now um, compared to, say, in Egypt or Tunisia um, or other countries in the region. And because of that, the prism that we get our news from Libya on is very distorted in many respects. And I think that there is a perception of Libya as basically this, I've, I've seen people refer to it as a failed state. I've seen, seen people uh, describe it as basically teetering on the brink of becoming another Somalia, an anarchic mm -hmm. state, a chaotic state. And you find that most, most often the commentators that are writing these kind of pieces have never been. So they're basically looking at everything through a particular prism. And one thing I resent about this kind of commentary on, Li on Libya is that it's very often shot through this kind of whether you were pro or against the yeah. intervention. So the people who were against the intervention pounce on every negative story coming out of Libya to say, told mm. you so, you know, we were right. And this was wrong, and this was a mess, and this is true. And, you know, Gaddafi warned that this would create another Somalia, and he was right, and, and all of that. So. You know, when you're on the ground over there, and I've met a lot of um, foreigners who weren't in Libya during the revolution, who've maybe arrived um, four or six months ago, 
and and they're terrified and they arrive in Tripoli and and if they meet another foreigner if they meet me for example in a hotel lobby they say but what about the security situation and you know how, how dangerous is it is it here and they're terrified to leave their hotels and and I say to them go out walk about see Tripoli is not another Mogadishu hmm. um, and you know go out there meet the people it's not this anarchic state sure there are challenges and there will be challenges for a very long time. A country cannot emerge from 42, 42 years of not just a dictatorship. I mean, this was a bizarre experiment in tyranny. You know, this was not, you know, you had the Mubarak dictatorship in, in Egypt. You had uh, Ben Ali in, in Tunisia. Gaddafi's system was a bizarre experiment in, in tyranny. In Libya, what they're having to do is build a, a state completely from scratch. The judicial system has to be built completely from scratch. There was no civil society infrastructure. There was no political in infrastructure. All of that has to be built um, from scratch. I spent some time during the summer um, volunteering as a trainer for Libyan journalists. Mm. And, and that was a really, it was a fascinating experience in that you know, some of the journalists I trained, they were all ages, all different backgrounds from different parts of, of Libya. Some of them had been journalists, if you could actually call them that, under Gaddafi, in that they work for, for state media. And uh, some of the stories they had to tell were fascinating. Like one woman told me about the first day she started at one of the state newspapers. It was one of Gaddafi's numerous anniversaries. He was always having anniversaries for particular landmarks and his glorious revolution. And uh, she was asked to go out on the street and do a vox pop um, about how people felt about this anniversary. And of course, there was only one answer, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, apparently the people were saying things like, oh, I'm, you know, very busy today, too busy really to mark us. Just their own way of actually giving an answer, but in a very kind of veiled way, I guess. And when she came back to her editor and, and presented uh, the, the Vox Pop, uh, he told her those are the wrong answers. And you're going to have to rewrite them <coughs> so that they're the right answers. Um, so it, stories like that. Um, and also you had then the, the younger journalists who were essentially accidental journalists. These were young people, students, engineers, uh, doctors, dentists, who became accidental journalists during the revolution. They were the people going out there with their mobile phones and that and filming things or just blogging stuff, putting stuff on Facebook, sending emails out and that. And it was interesting because they had gone from being <coughs> activists to journalists mm. and they, they found that transition difficult in that when they had to cover the, the new government, for example, they were all caught up with this idea of we have to protect our revolution. We, we were active protagonists in, our, in this revolution that ousted Gaddafi. Now we have to protect this revolution. So we need to be nice to our leaders. We need to be nice to our government. And they were not, I think it will still take time for them to um, challenge you know, yeah. their, their elected representatives. And, and I can remember one day reminding them uh, uh, the famous lines from jo George Orwell, you know, that good reporting is reporting something that someone somewhere doesn't want reported. Mm. Everything else is just public relations. Yeah. And uh, they liked that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> now, whether, how long it'll take for them to actually adopt that and their everyday reporting is another, yeah. another issue. I mean, that all with Maxim also kind of comes to mind when you talk about Syria. And like, mm. it's interesting when you were going through your list of kind of like, I mean, uh, toppled uh, dictators, you know, uh, in Tunisia and Egypt. I mean, Syria, like the, the, that boy is still there. I mean, you've a lot of experience in Syria. What's your take on where things are right now? Well, um, I visited Syria um, several times when I lived in Jordan, uh, neighboring Jordan, until 2007, and reported from Syria a number of times before the uprising started. And, you know, Syria, Gaddafi didn't like journalists, um, you know, in Libya at the no, beginning. No one likes journalists. That's yeah. true, that's true. We're right down there Quite with right. second hand <laughs> car salesmen. Um, but, in Syria, they really did not like journalists. And I can remember reporting from there before the, the uprising and the, the furtiveness that was required, you know, negoci negotiating the hard lines of Assad's police state, which is the most brutal police state in the region. You know, Egypt was a police state under Mubarak, but Syria is in, it was always in a league of its own. And the Syrian intelligence service is one of the most feared in the region. Um, so, when the anti-regime protests broke out in Syria, I think everybody expected that this would be the bloodiest chapter 
of the events that some people have taken to referring to as the Arab Spring. I don't like the term myself, but anyway, the events, let's just say. Um, and I think that from a journalist perspective, the Syria story has been extremely difficult um, in many respects. First of all, whatever about Gaddafi trying to prevent journalists coming into to Libya, and he labeled all of us Al-Qaeda collaborators when we came in illegally over the border from, from Egypt. In Syria, um, journalists have become real targets. Um, journalists have, if, if basically there are two ways to report the Syria story now. You can get a regime visa if you're very, very lucky, um, uh, which basically restricts you pretty much to Damascus and, and areas around. Um, you're obviously monitored by mm. the regime and um, the people you speak to. There are all kinds of ramifications for them because they will be monitored also. So it's very, very difficult. The other alternative is to be smuggled over the Lebanese or Turkish uh, borders illegally. Um, so you're essentially very often embedded with rebel forces or you're traveling within rebel-held territory. And we've seen how many colleagues that we've lost in, in Syria last year, more than 28, several so far this year, including there were two journalists killed in 24 hours in, in January. So Syria is without doubt the most dangerous story in the world right now, I think. And the frustrating thing about reporting Syria is that we have fragments of the story. Mm. So we're getting the story from people who, and it's a dwindling number of people who can get regime visas now, and we have the story from the rebel-held territories. We don't have the full story. Um, and this is a, a story, after all, where more than 60,000 people have been killed at this stage, and counting. Um, you know, it seems like every few weeks we hear that, oh, today was the worst day in terms of mm. casualties um, in Syria. But, you know, I was speaking at a, a conference, a media conference down in Cork yesterday, and I was asked to speak about the role of, of the um, war correspondent. And uh, I know we'll be talking about this earlier, mm. and both of us detest the, the term. I always say I'm not a war correspondent. I'm a journalist who happens to cover wars and conflicts every so often. But anyway... Um, you know, the, the idea that people, the, the reporters that go out there to cover conflicts, cover wars, the idea of being there, simply being there, bearing witness, this is one of the fundamentals of our craft. And I think we saw in Libya how important that was. Um, I mean, just, you know, a couple of what I said earlier about the, um, the man who, I didn't mention earlier, sorry, I mentioned it yesterday. Um, one thing that remains with me, a man I met in Benghazi when I arrived, shortly after I arrived, and he, he said, you know, we suffered a massacre here, and there was no one here to see it, meaning that he was referring to the hundreds that were killed in Benghazi in the initial days of the anti-regime protests when the regime tried to put down those protests. And, you know, they, they got out the grainy footage that people had filmed on their mobile phones, but it wasn't that big impact, yeah. you know, of coverage that you need big international media organizations to be in there on the ground. And, and that's a line that has really stayed with me. And, you know, I can remember um, giving a, a presentation on Libya in, in Dublin late last year, and one man in the audience who um, accused me of, um, of telling lies in my coverage of, of um, Libya. And uh, this man was, uh, was a, a fan of Gaddafi. And uh, he told me that, oh, this was nonsense, that there was going to be a massacre, that Gaddafi was going to do something terrible to Benghazi. Um, and, and I said to him, I said, well, it's interesting that you, you seem to believe that, because I don't know if you listened to Gaddafi's uh, broadcast in which he um, threatened in very blood-curdling language to cleanse Benghazi uh, of rats, as he was referring to the protesters against his regime, cleanse it street by street, house by house, and alley by alley. And I was in Benghazi the day the, of the very first French airstrikes. And I drove out, the, there was a, a regime convoy on its way into Benghazi, which is a city of one million people. And uh, later that day, I drove out and counted every tank on that road. Every regime tank, every regime armored car, every pickup truck that they had mounted with grad rocket launchers that can fire 40 grad rockets in one go. And they were, all of, this whole convoy was on the edge of the city of one million people. I think there was no question as to what was going to happen. Yeah. You know? And, I was, I, and I, so I said to this man, I said, I was there. I counted the tanks, literally. You know, a, a friend of mine was, was in Aleppo um, 
earlier this month when there was an incident, um, some of you here may have uh, may recall reading about it, where um, dozens of bodies were found on the bank of a river in Aleppo. Um, they were all men, they had their hands tied behind their backs. And the regime declared that this was basically, uh, these men had been killed by terrorist gangs, which of course is the language, the, the term they use to describe um, the people who were driving the uprising against the regime. And a friend of mine who happened to be in Aleppo at the time uh, arrived on the scene and counted the bodies. The simple act mm -hmm. of counting mm -hmm. the bodies and photographing the bodies. Talking to the men's relatives who confirmed that the men had been from the opposition side and that they had been killed by regime forces. Now, going back to that idea of the importance of being there and bearing witness, if there had not been reporters in Aleppo, like my friend, who could literally count the bodies, this incident would have, like so many, so much of what's happened in Syria over the last two years, disappeared into the horrific fog of Syria's war. And, you know, I think. People who do the kind of work that we do, Ed, we're, and particularly because we've lost so many colleagues over the last yeah. two years, some of the best of the in the business, you know, Anthony Shadid, for example, who, you know, I would have considered the best journalist reporting the Middle East. Um, he was a, a Lebanese American um, reporter for the New York Times. With you know, his reporting from Iraq, his tremendous empathy for the people he was reporting on. He was, you know, he was peerless. Um, we lost Marie Calvin, we lost Remy Oshlik, we lost Tim Hetherington, so many big, big names. And it has prompted so much soul searching within, um, within the, the band of, of people yeah. who do this kind of work as to, is it worth it? Is it worth the lives lost? Um, is it worth the, the heartbreak of those left behind? Do, <clears throat> does what we do make a difference? Um, and uh, it's a difficult question for many of us. I know people, people we both know who were very close to Mikalva, for example, that will not go into Syria because of what happened. Of what happened. And uh, it's, um, but I think that we, we owe it to the friends and colleagues we've lost to, um, to keep going to those places, keep telling mm. those stories. Mm. And Syria, most of all. I mean, like, like you know, Syria has always struck me as, as someone just watching watching the story developing and someone's interested in news, like Syria just is debauchery. It, is just, it just strikes me as just a, a very depraved place, a place where, like, I mean, Assad and his tugs, his regime, have just held on to power for too long, you know? Move, let's, let's, move away from, let's move away from Syria and, and move on to a, a story that's been in the news lately. I suppose, I, I, I suppose a lot of people, especially a lot of music people, were, were paying a lot of attention to Mali when, like, I mean, the, the, the Mali troubles happened because Mali has produced so much good, good, good music. Like, um, I, I, I thought it was quite interesting, you know, have, having spent time there uh, and, and, and Senegal and just kind of, like, knowing the people and knowing what was going on and just seeing what the people's reaction was to, like, I mean, the trouble that was there recently and how they reacted to it. As someone who's been kind of reporting on kind of, like, jihadists, uh, on, pe on, on basically, like, like, like uprisings, how did you read the Mali situation? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting what hooks people's stories, isn't it? Yeah, because, yeah. you know, like Mali, for example, people will be aware of Mali for its music and, and that kind of thing. Or people will know Timbuktu, for example, and, and that kind of thing. It's interesting just what, yeah, what hooks yeah. people to, to stories. As a journalist, I always find it fascinating in terms of what will cause readers to actually gravitate towards a particular story. You know, the, the Mali story, I know some of... The reporting of it has said, oh, this is just blowback from Libya, you know, and if Gaddafi hadn't been ousted, then Mali would have been fine, which is not the case. I mean, there was trouble brewing in, in, in Mali and that broader region for quite some time before that. Um, I would be very um, wary of some of the kind of backslapping we're seeing in France right now. I mean, yeah. uh, Hollande, François Hollande, the French president, was was in Timbuktu the other week, you know, on a victory lap. Um, I think it might be a little premature for that uh, just yet. Yes, they've managed to um, uh, flush out, if you like, um, the the militants that were holding uh, Timbuktu and the town of Gao, but these people have basically faded into the shadows, you know, um, and uh, there is wide open territory in Mali where it will be quite difficult to get rid of these people. But I think it's interesting, I, I was struck actually when the town of, of Gao, when the French and, and Malian troops arrived in the town of Gao, which was the first town uh, that they carried operations out in. 
And it was interesting to see the contrast between, I watched a report that uh, France 2, French uh, state broadcaster, had run. And then I watched Lindsay's, Lindsay Hilson's report for, for Channel 4. And it was really interesting because the, the French state TV report, it was um, so jingoistic, you know, and that it was all, you know, all, everybody welcoming, you know, the, the French and, and Malian troops, everybody flying, you know, French flags and, and all, we love France and all that kind of thing. Lindsay had some of that in her report, but she also had the footage of the dead bodies around the town, which the Malian army were claiming were young militants. Uh, there was none of that in the French uh, report, which was very hoo-ha, our troops. Um, it was interesting, in the, the first day of the French military operations, there was um, uh, Le Monde, the French newspaper, has a great cartoonist, and uh, that day they had a, a cartoon of Hollande as Tantan, Tantan in, in Mali. Um, so I think that in France, there are people who are quite ambivalent about the, the, um, the intervention there. And I think it's, some, it's an intervention that will go on for some time yet. Yeah, I mean, it's also if the French don't realize that the intervention, intervention is going to go on some time either. You know, and also there's not a lot of people saying that the French approach to what happened to Mali may be the way to go in the future. Would you agree with that? I would say it's not over yet. Um, and I would be very, very wary of, as I said, declaring any kind of victory. I think um, some of the noises coming from Paris in terms of that are, are premature. This is not over yet. Um, you know, there, there's all this talk about training up the Malian army. Um, we know that the Irish government says that it's actively considering, in their language, um, uh, Irish troops' participation in an EU mission to train uh, the Malian army. This is going to take a long, long time. Mm. And, you know, the people who were being targeted in these operations, they have spread out. Mali is a big country. Mm. Um, and, you know, the borders in that part of North Africa are very, you know, they're, they're not even lines in the sand, you know. So the borders are very porous. So we saw, I think, the, the attack in, um, in, in mm -hmm. Algeria, you know, this was being planned before the, the Mali operations. So while there is a connection between the two, it's not the only thing behind that particular attack. But we're talking about a, a regional dynamic here where you have porous borders and people passing over those borders. We're talking about a nexus that involves drugs, drug uh, running, uh, guns, and Islamist militancy, um, and that's quite a toxic mix. Mm. I mean, so basically, what's going, what you're saying is that the the era of uprisings and instability in that particular area is just probably beginning. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, I I kind of have an I have an issue with a lot of the the analysis and the the, the kind of headlines about the events of the last years, and yeah. that you know. First of all, we had the Arab Spring, and then we saw the headlines saying, you know, the Arab Spring is turning into the Islamist winter, and da da da. Hey, and so, so there's a terrible ball. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, I my answer to that is that anyone who knows the Middle East knows that in the first elections in any of these countries um, uh, after you know decades of dictatorship. It was very likely, I mean, Libya bucked the trend, but it was very likely, as we saw in Tunisia and Egypt, that Islamist movements, Islamist political parties would win those initial elections. Because you're talking about societies calcified by decades of dictatorship, where, for example, in Egypt, where you have a, a president who comes from the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood worked um, you know, and on the ground for decades, you know, social welfare programs, educational programs. In many ways, the Muslim Brother provided a safety net of sorts for the millions of rural and urban uh, Egyptian poor. So, of course, that was going to translate into votes in, in, the, in the ballot box when, when elections finally came. And, you know, I can remember conversations I had with, with people in, in Egypt over the years, members of the Egyptian elite, um, who would always say, oh, you know, democracy is not for Egypt. Mm. Um, and uh, they would say, because, you know, we have 40% illiteracy and blah, blah, blah. No, we, we can't have democracy, not for us, because if we have democracy in Egypt, then the Islamists will come to power. And I, and I always said to them, well, do you think that in Europe we waited until there was a particular level of literacy and a particular level of political sophistication before we said, OK, I think we're ready for free and fair elections now, and let's see how that goes. No, of course, democracy is a messy process. And no one said it was going to be easy after uh, these dictators were removed. Um, 
the region is going through enormous change on political levels, economic levels, social levels. You know, it's 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 just this time where so many different dynamics are coming together, mm. and um, it's going to be uh, difficult for for a long time yet. Yeah, I mean that's and that's a good as a good a, a, a point as any to like I mean widen the conversation out and bring bring Ed back in in terms of like you know the role of coverage of these areas. I mean we were talking earlier on, you know, I, I was talking to you and you separately earlier on about like you know how newspapers regard kind of like, like you know foreign correspondence and coverage of these areas. And it, you, there's something you said earlier on, Mary, that really struck me you were talking about like you know the, the, the this this plurality of, co of coverage the fact that you've got people in these areas who are like I me mean, bloggers journalists people who've become accidental bloggers journalists via social media reporting all these kind of news out you've got this kind of fractured picture do you think that's going to be the way it's going to become in the future that like newspapers are just going to like, use all these kind of on the ground people rather than kind of send out send in experienced people like yourself into, into cover these areas well i think i mean giving given how much our industry is atomizing um uh, and we are all having to cope with shrinking budgets, means that the, the golden age, if there ever was one, of the foreign correspondent is over. It's never coming back. Uh, very few media organizations can afford to have an array of foreign correspondents now. Um, so what had happened to coverage of the Middle East, for example, even before the, the revolutions and uprisings began, was that you saw that newsrooms were starting to rely on this army of freelancers in the mm. region. And, and that increased after the, the events of, of spring 2011. Um, and what's interesting is that, for example, Syria, um, a number, and the Sunday Times was the most recent media outlet to join uh, this, this group of media outlets that are basically saying to uh, freelancers now, we're not going to take material from Syria because it's too dangerous. And we don't want you as a freelancer to be taking risks that we can't kind of cover for. And I think that's really worrying because if we don't have those people in on the ground, how is that story going to be told? You know, I think what happens, what needs to happen in the industry is that basically people say, okay, we're relying on freelancers, so we will provide insurance for them. Mm -hmm. we, will in we will insist that they have hostile environment training and all that kind of thing. They have the right equipment. But the answer is not to retreat from the story entirely. But I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about citizen journalism and, and all of that. We've seen the difficulties, uh, whether it was in Libya, particularly in Syria, of relying on raw, unfiltered footage coming out from activists because they are activists. And we have seen how, particularly from Syria, photographs and footage has been uh, faked, has been manipulated. Um, you know, there was one extraordinary uh, case last year where a photograph was put on a BBC website, um, purportedly of a, a massacre in, um, in Syria. And it was actually a photograph that had been taken in Iraq by a Spanish photographer who saw it and had to contact the BBC and said, well, sorry, that's my photograph it was taken in Iraq several years ago. It's not Syria. So we have to be really careful about how all those that kind of material is filtered through. But I suppose the point I'm making, and I'm not just making this because you know I'm, I'm working in an industry that is facing huge challenges. Um, there is still a need to have journalists on the ground that are doing what a reporter does, which is to report what they see happen in front of them, yeah. okay? And basically relay that back, as opposed to getting footage from people who are on the field that you may not have met in person, but you've spoken to them on Skype or whatever, but you don't know what their agenda is. And now I know there, I mean, we see Storyful, for example, in, in Dublin, a, a new media company that basically filters and has a methodology to kind of verify a lot of this video um, footage that's coming through. But still, you know, I think we cannot rely on that. We need to have reporters on the field. Mm. I mean, Ed, like, it's like going back to Mexico, you know, and that whole thing Mary's used to talk about that you report what you see in front of you. Mm. I mean, are there other journalists like you out there? I mean, is, is, or is it, is it the case that this story, you, you're finding more and more that certain stories just being ignored by press? I mean, there are levels of fear in this, as, as Mary knows only too well. Um, and I think we've all, in the back of our minds, come to terms with the fact that we might get killed. We've come to terms with the fact, perhaps worse, that we might get badly wounded. But torture is another thing. I, I wouldn't know where to begin. I mean, if, if, if um, I mean, Me Mexico, 
There's now, I think, 58, we think, known to have been killed, another 20 missing. And, you know, they're not killed by shrapnel or, or, or a sniper's bullet. Um, uh, the, the cartels are brilliant because they know it's not a good idea to, well, so far anyway, uh, uh, do these, this to an American or a European journalist. They're doing it to Mexican journalists, and so long as they do it to Mexican journalists, the, United, the media in the United States and Europe won't care much, to be honest. Um, and, but I, and I thought a lot of this dis discourse was actually sort of media naval watching. I think, well, hang on a minute, if there's 60,000 people dead, why are we talking about 58 journalists? That's just us. You know. But I was corrected on this by someone who said, no, it's actually crucial to the strategy. There comes a point at which the death of our colleagues that Mary's talking about is, is you know, <laughs> to use that awful term, collateral. They just happen to be in the wrong, wrong place. Or they're targeted, or they're part of the strategy. What the, how the cartels take territories. One, they take over all the people with guns, police, military, federalists, whatever. Then you take over the politicians. Then you take over the press to make sure that none of this is reported. Yeah. And you do that either by uh, implication, and making people know quite well what will happen to them if they, if they do report or question this, or, or, or you um, kill them so, with, with, so cruelly that no, it doesn't occur to anyone to do it. Um, it's got to the point now where, where if you ask the question, who's in control here, that is a death sentence. Mm. Um, th th there's also this other point about, um, as Mary talks about this thing of it, you know, it, <laughs> these things don't end quickly. One of, the, one of, the, one of the, the really pernicious things about political discourse now and about um, and about much of the media's willingness to, to you know to to to, to 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 use it to use their language is this idea of these quick fixes. I mean, you know, as Mary says, these things go on and yeah. on and on. In 1924, the first serious bombing of civilians took place in Iraq by the British, a rather over enthusiastic flight lieutenant called Harris who clearly had some kind of psychotic problem because he's become quite well known in Dresden since then. Um, uh, um, you know, it just goes, it's this endless cyclical thing. Uh, slightly shorter time frame, Osama bin Laden got his first Kalashnikov from the CIA. Um, we were talking earlier about this extraordinary story Mary's got about and the people who remember that. Um, you know, and Mary's one of the very few people who, who joins those dots and reminds people about the depths and, and, yeah. and, and, and of these things. And, you know, we're always sort of told that, that, that this can be a quick fix. I mean, you know, Blair, the Blair-Cheney-Bush axis were the sort of the worst of this. No sense of, of, uh, of, of mission unaccomplished. No sense of this, these things. It's not like a football match. You don't just have the three extra minutes after the whistle. Yeah. It goes on and on and on. And we in the media, are, you know, with very, very few exceptions, and, and, you know, this lady's alone in her generation, literally, of understanding the depths of these yeah. things. Um, and, just, just and, on, just and, on the point. That, sorry, just yeah. to finish the point. Yeah. That is something that this so-called citizen journalism does never really addresses it's yeah. not there's no part it's no part of the of, of the of the of the agenda of the blogging and the mobile phone to remind people that bomber harris was doing this 88 decades ago that, you know it, it, and, and it does take i mean i'm not a someone i think there's it's, there's an outrageous number of charlatans who get on planes going through the clippings with a straw boater um coming to tell all these little colored people about what's happening to them in their country. I can't stand that imperial sort of journalism. But it's that sense of depth and history. And as you said, this yeah. thing, no, Mali, we're, we're going to be talking about Mali in 40 years' time. Yeah. Whatever, whatever happens or doesn't happen, whatever Jean Hollande says, you know, there's just two points. You, you mentioned earlier on uh, like something about like when you were in Syria, there was two ways of getting in Syria. There was going in, you either got a regime pass or you got smuggled in. Talk to me through, I mean, like what, the rule of, of kind of like, let, I, I'm going to call it for correspondent. I'm not going to say war correspondent or anti-war correspondent. The rule of correspondence, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you get a regime pass, I mean, like can we kind of, resume, kind of assume that anyone with a regime pass is a patsy for the regime? Well, I've certainly uh, read reports where I would, I would wish that the journalist writing the report was 
clearer. I mean, I know the conditions, the restrictions they're operating under. I'm not so sure that the lay reader will understand, and I think they should be more explicit in that. There have been um, some journalists who've gone to Damascus and regime visas. Uh, Janine De Giovanni, for example, who went, and um, this was about a week, I think, after the massacre in Dara, which is a town uh, near Damascus, and she went to Dara um, secretly. Um, and filed an amazing dispatch uh, for The Guardian on that. Now, so there are journalists who are pushing, yeah. you know, the boundaries there on a regime visa. Now, whether she will get a regime visa again, that's open to, to question. There, you know, without naming any names, there have been some reports um, from Syria people on regime visas that, you know, I've found quite extraordinary in that um, one report a series of reports um, a few weeks after I left uh, Aleppo. And uh, Aleppo at that stage, that was uh, August, uh, several weeks of fighting had happened. Uh, the rebel forces had entered the city. It was supposedly the decisive battle for both sides and all that kind of thing. Um, friends of mine were still in Aleppo. They were on the in the rebel-held districts. And um, so there was a series of dispatches in a, in a let's just say, European newspaper. Um, and reading these dispatches, you would not have thought that this was a city under aerial bombardment um, by the regime. Um, and basically, the reporter had gone embedded with the Syrian yeah. army, had reported what its generals were saying with credulity, and, uh, and basically re repeating their narrative. And I think that this, it's, it's extraordinary that that can still happen. And it was quite striking that this series of reports was then run on Syrian state media. So that particular journalist, you know, left right. the regime very happy indeed. Yeah, yeah they were happy right to put the, 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 the reports out there. Yeah, but do you, do you think some of it is down to maybe time pressures as well? I mean, or, or is it a case that some, some journalists who get these regime passes and who uh, are happy to kind of like state that side of the story you know, that's, that's the way that you should apply the same scepticism to everything they've written then, because I mean, if they're prepared to accept the regime uh, hospitality in one area, maybe that's the way that's been all through their career. I mean, possibly. I think, you know, for, for some, uh, I can remember a conversation I had in, in Beirut in, in July with a, uh, a Spanish journalist who's lived in, in Beirut for quite some time, and, um, you know, he was defending the regime. And, and I think that you know, th this particular journalist was in his late 60s. And I think that there is yeah. um, maybe a, there are some people who have covered the Middle East for a very long time for whom I think the Syria story is difficult in terms of what Syria uh, represented in, in, the re in the region. Um, so the, you know, the Syria story is, we all know, an extremely complicated story in terms of how Syria fits into that regional dynamic, all the interests that converge in Syria all the interests that are now um, increasingly part of what's going on in the ground over there. But, you know, I was at an event with Lindsay Hilsom uh, last year and, um, you know, a couple of people in the audience uh, said that we, you know, that the coverage, they were complaining about coverage of Syria and they were saying that, they were claiming that, you know, everybody knows that Syria, it's, it's a big ex conspiracy against the regime. It's, a, it's an American and Saudi and Qatari and Israeli conspiracy against the, the, the Syrian regime. And I've heard this so many times. I heard this about Libya as well, people who are making excuses for Gaddafi. And, you know, at that stage, I, I you know, I had enough of listening to this. And I said, um, look, you know, there is no doubt that outside external interests have now increasingly taken a role on both sides in what's happening in Syria. But I said, I've spent time in Syria, like I spent time in Libya. And I've met the people who have gone out there on the streets since early 2011, who have seen their relatives and friends mowed down by this regime. And I'm telling you, when you tell them, as I have, I said, you know, some people in Europe, they think that what's going on here is an external conspiracy, nothing at all to do with the Syrian people. And I said, you know what, how that uh, sounds to them? You know, they have lost friends and relatives for simply going out demanding change, demanding, you know, not so much, I think, you know, it wasn't so much democracy that people were ch uh, chanting for in the streets of Egypt and Tunisia, Libya, and, and Syria. I think the one word that sums up what people were looking for was dignity, a dignified life. Because what people were living in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Syria was not a dignified life. And I think to reduce all that down to some kind of external conspiracy, 
is extraordinarily condescending. And it's Orientalism by any other name. Yeah. You know, yeah. you are basically saying these people are not in charge of their own destiny. They never will be. And one thing, I think, no matter what the challenges are now, and things will be difficult for a long time yet in the region, but one thing for sure is that in the last two years, the people of the region have lost their fear. And anyone who spent time in the Middle East knows what that fear was like, whether it was Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, or Syria. This all-encompassing fear that seeped into all elements of life, that's gone now, and that will never return. And no matter what the difficulties are and the challenges, people have turned that corner, and they're not going back. And that's something that when you talk to Libyans, when you talk to Egyptians and Syrians, who acknowledge the difficulties still, they're proud of achieving that, because that is a huge achievement. True. Okay, I'm just looking at the clock, and we've, we've ran well over time. So I, I promised Mary I wouldn't ask a, a certain question, and I'm not going to ask that question, but it's, it's another question I know a lot of people out in the room who've been listening to this have kind of got, got their heads. For both of you, I mean, you're describing war scenes. You, you talked to me earlier on about like I me mean, sleeping in safe houses, Mary, you know, you're dressing your clothes because the minute the shelling starts, you've got to go, you know, and it's like... You're talking, you, you talk about like, you mean, going into villages where people have been decapitated or whatever. I mean, this is dangerous shit. I mean, this is really dangerous shit. Why do you do it? Either, either of you. Why do you do it? I know, this, I know, Mary, you're kind of going, he told me he wouldn't ask the women's magazine question, but I know <laughs> the people out there are kind of going, it's dangerous. Ed, why do you do it? Well, there are different, uh, I don't know why I do it. Uh, I keep trying to stop doing it, actually. Um, and then something happens and I. Um, I'm reminded of why I've got to do something. It's, uh, it's. Um, I mean, okay. <clears throat> Some people do it because they enjoy it. We can't get away from that. There's a place in London called the Frontline Club, and I, they had a Christmas oh, party, and I was invited a female friend, small f friend, um, and said, I, there are, "Oh, I'd love to go." I, but I just can't face all those men talking about their erections on the front line, and I knew exactly what she meant. It's not. It's a figurative point of course and um, although not entirely figurative actually I mean in Sarajevo the reason I based myself in northwestern Bosnia and central Bosnia not in Sarajevo because like the press corps in Sarajevo were, there were some wonderful people there but a lot of them were you know, screwing the translators enjoying the black market and having the best party of their lives I mean there is that um, then there are the people who sort of uh, get bored in Sarajevo oh I've got to go to Grozny it's too quiet I mean there is there is that um, Marie Colvin, I knew very well, and our friendship was based on antagonism. A, because she was the Sunday Times, I was the Observer. B, because she was embedded with, in Chalabi's camp in Iraq, and I felt I was passionately against the war. But we got to know each other really well, and I said to her, Marie, once, I'm sort of after Mexico, I'm sort of pulling out now. Uh, I've used up all my coupons, and you have too, Marie, I said to her. I said, you know, you've run out of luck vouchers, and if you keep doing this, because she sort of, uh, you know, sorry, Marie, if I'm wrong, but uh, probably down there, actually. I hope so, for her sake. Um, uh, you know, sorry, Marie, but you, you, you're you pushing it. You know, you enjoy this too much. I don't. Um, I write about war because I hate war. That wasn't always the case. When I was a student at Oxford University, loathing it, to be honest, despite the privilege, it's a terrible waste of a place, um, I came here because I thought it was weird that all these people were punting around having a May fucking ball while British soldiers were shooting people in Derry. That's why I came and did a very pretentious thesis on how the civil rights movement became the provisional IRA. I wouldn't recommend anyone, to, certainly not going to allow anyone to read it now. It's a lot of rubbish. But, um, but um, I, I, I was fascinated by it, yeah. absolutely compelled. And I still am in a way, but, but I, I call myself an anti-war correspondent. I write about it because I hate it. Um, you know, I'd, there are people who think Jefferson Airplane is some kind of drone. You know, I mean, I'm, I know who they are. You know, that's where <laughs> I'm not a pacifist, but that's where I'm coming from, you know. Um, and um, I suppose ultimately it's the lesson I learned in Iraq and in Bosnia. Uh, that the decency and the courage of the good people is so much more interesting than what Hannah Arendt called, right. quite rightly, the banality of evil. Uh, you know, the, 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 the scumbaggery of the narcos and the, and the Serbian camp guards and rapists. You know, um, it's, it's contempt. It doesn't excite me. And you know, one does it, um, hopefully, for the, for, for the decent people. But I'm afraid to say I don't have, and I'm unpopular in my profession in this way, I don't have any illusion that we make any difference. 
see, I think that is a fantasy that the media, in just with which it justifies itself. You know, when you've been in Bosnia for three years and you've discovered concentration camps and systematic mass rape, and for three years after that, the politicians, hey, we've got a very good new peace plan here. And uh, you, you're making no difference whatsoever. And that, I'm afraid, is the brutal reality. Okay, thank you, Ed. Which is, is even less reason to do it. But isn't there a question there, Ed, that if we were not there at all, that would also have an impact? Well, it means the good readers, you know, of, just of, to reverse the good that readers of Solihull would not know about it. But it doesn't make any difference that the good readers of Solihull know. No, I, 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 I mean, two, two million people marched against Blair, saying, we don't want your fucking war. Oh, thank you very much, go to war. And we mustn't. You, you're younger than I am. And she called herself a Libya optimist. Good. And a Libyophile. I'm pessimistic about most things. I apologize for that. But, it, but, it, but you have to be a Libyophile. I was a Bosniophile. I'm a Mexicophile. You're a Libyophile. We have to have the enthusiasm. And you do you're wonder you're what's still in, you, you look, do. You're still enthusiastic. I mean, you're still enthusiastic. I you are. I mean, we've had phone of calls. I we've had phone calls which ran for hours planning this. I mean, like, the phone go, Ed's number will come up, I go, okay, I'll sit down, find a comfy course, seat. You're, you're very optimistic, course, you know. Another but thing, the other thing is that Mary's, Mary's one of a breed. You've got to wonder what's in the Irish water supply that affects women in particular. I mean, and it's amazing. It's, it's Maggie in Bosnia. It's all up everywhere. Now it's Mary. There's somebody else whose name escapes me. And, and you are in a class of your own, you ladies. You don't play the sort of Vanity Fair, I put on lipstick and become the kind of Amazon. You know that dreadful thing where you yeah. have to glam up for some it's a It's an amazing thing. And I've just remembered what it was that reminded me about the, the depth issue. Most people who report from Africa do not quote Robert Case, Roger Casement. You did. Very good. Mary, That's why, we why do, do you do it? I do it for the people like the man in Benghazi who said to me, we suffered a massacre here and there was no one here to see it. Um, the people I met in Libya whose stories demanded to be told. The people I met in Syria whose stories demanded to be told. The people I've met in Afghanistan, in Darfur, in Congo, whose stories demand to be told. Whose stories I believe should be told at a time when, unfortunately, news co foreign news coverage is shrinking because media organizations cannot afford it anymore. And I believe that I owe it to the dear friends and colleagues that I've lost to, to continue doing this work. We all wrestle with that question, do we make a difference? I know you've reached your conclusion. No, don't, um, don't, don't reach my conclusion, um, please. But you know, we're, we're, we all yeah. wrestle with it, of yeah. course. Um, a very dear friend of mine in Pakistan was tortured to death. Um, because of his investigative reporting on the nexus between Pakistani um, intelligence services and militant groups. And um, I think we owe it to people like him um, and his legacy to continue doing the very important work that we do. Mary and Ed, a huge round of applause, please.